Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Hello there. Today we're talking with Chris Wright, who is the BizOps leader at CLA. And you might be wondering what BizOps is and who CLA is. And Chris is going to go into all that on the show. Uh, it's a little bit of a non-traditional podcast, so we're not talking to a founder in this one. CLA is a uh, national accounting firm. And Chris and I go deep into some of the back office operations for small businesses, common mistakes, things you should be looking into, uh, and what they do at CLA. So a little bit non-traditional, but hopefully you'll get a lot out of this. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, please do that. Leave us a review. You can drop me a note at mkelly at startupcompetitors.com if you want to get in touch with me personally. And thank you so much for listening. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we have Chris Wright, who is with CLA. Chris, welcome. Thanks, Mike. It's my pleasure. Why don't we open things up with a quick overview of CLA and what you and the team do? Yeah, you bet, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, CLA is the eighth largest public accounting firm in the country. We have over 120 offices nationwide, over 6,000 employees. And what really sets CLA apart, we feel from the other uh, big accounting firms out there, is that while we do the traditional you know, assurance type services, audits, reviews, compilations, and we do a lot of tax work, obviously, we also do a lot of outsourcing work. And that's BizOps, which we'll get more into here in just a few minutes. That is our CAST group. CAST basically focuses on a lot of short-term, full-time type projects. BizOps is more focused on part-time, long-term projects. And then we also have a talent solutions group that focuses on HR, uh, talent placement for companies. And we have a wealth advisory group as well, too. So, you know, CLA is able to offer a vast array of services. And, and like I said, with, with having 120 offices nationwide, and over 6,000 employees, if I get a phone call from a client locally and they ask me a question that I may not have the answer to right away, I know I can pick up the phone, I can send a quick email to one of my colleagues, and I'll have an answer for that client in a really short period of time. So it makes it really nice you know, to be affiliated with a, with a, a firm like CLA that we all feel like family. Uh, we feel like we're all working you know, together uh, seamlessly. It's really a pleasure uh, working for CLA. And, and, and you know, CLA is about creating opportunities, creating opportunities for our clients, our employees, and our communities. And you know, that's that's important to us. It's a it's a it's a um, a value that the CLA holds pretty dear. And it's we we try to live that every day. And, and one thing, another thing too, that that really sets CLA apart from some of the bigger firms is that you know, CLA made a strategic decision to not do audits of publicly traded companies. We just decided it wasn't an arena we wanted to play in, and we really wanted to focus on privately held businesses. We will do some publicly traded company work uh, on the valuation side, but when it comes to you know audits and really just uh, general type services, we really focus on those private businesses, and we really want to be partners to those business owners from s- startup to scale up uh, to eventual exit. Awesome. And hit me with a little bit of your background. How did you get to uh, where you're at with CLA? Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Um, I've been in industry prior to coming to CLA. I've been with CLA for almost, I guess, 16, 17 months now. Prior to CLA, uh, I worked in industry. The last nine to 10 years, I was CFO for a, a small local company here in town. And so I spent a lot of my, a lot of my career uh, in private industry. Uh, growing up the ranks, you know, from, uh, you know, senior accountant, county manager, controller, all the way up to CFO. And I came upon CLA, I, a good friend of mine that I grew up with, Dave Hickman, he runs our, our our talent talent solutions group at CLA. He and I were talking, I believe it was the summer of 2018, about some opportunities that CLA had uh, coming available. And one was to lead the, biz, lead the biz ops group here in Indianapolis. And What really attracted me to it was being part of BizOps, you work with a variety of clients and you can really go alongside those business owners as a real partner to them. And like I said earlier, you know, help them, help them start up, help them scale up. And so 
you know, the opportunity was afforded to me and I took it. And so now it's, you know, I've been uh, leading the office here, like I said, for almost, you know, 17 months now. There's a staff of 12 of us, 12 of us, excuse me. And we range from the staff account level all the way to CFOs. And we can really, uh, like I said, we, we, we'd like to be companies accounting departments. So those business owners can really focus on what they're good at, and that's growing their business. I feel like I should have known this from past conversations, and maybe I did and I've forgotten. But <laughs> did you start the biz ops practice here locally? No, or No, no, no. It, 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 okay. it, it was around. No, it's, biz ops has been you know part of CLA for, uh, I think, firm-wide uh, over 10 years now. A little over ten years, so no, I, I did not start the group. It was it was it was already here, um, but they brought me in to to lead the uh, lead the group, and yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure ever since. And it, and you're kind of a non traditional guest for startup competitors because CLA is obviously not a startup. And uh, one of the things that I thought would be interesting would be to kind of dive into biz ops and what it looks like um, from a small business perspective to one, work with you guys. And then two, uh, also to kind of pull on your experience of working with, I would presume, you know, hundreds of, of uh, clients over the years to to also understand like, you know, what are some of the common patterns that you see or, you know, early mistakes, things that when your team comes in, you end up having to clean up. Uh, because as you can imagine, there are a lot of people who either are thinking about starting a business who listen to this podcast or uh, are running a, a small business. So maybe let's let's dive into that. Go a little bit deeper on what some of the biz ops services are and then maybe a little bit about what it looks like to be a, a biz ops client. Yeah, Absolutely. Like I said, we've we've got uh, we can start out on the transactional side, Mike. So I mean, if, if if companies are looking for you know they they need some help on the you know accounts receivable, accounts payable, you know just booking general general journal entries, basic accounting you know information that that they just maybe don't understand or they just really don't have the time to to, to deal with. We can start out. Uh, you know, in in, the, in just really like I said, the basic transactional type things like the accounts payable entry, you know, customer billing, maintaining the customer, maintaining your customers, you know, cash receipts, tracking grants for nonprofits, that type of thing. And then we can go into you know, obviously we can go into you know, uh, balance sheet reconciliations. You know, we can reconcile your your bank accounts, your credit card accounts, track your fixed assets for you. Uh, we can prepare your monthly financial statements. So your balance sheet, your profit and loss, your cash flow statement. And also, too, you know, we can go in and, you know, at a little higher level, you know, once we close your books, you know, prepare those financial statements, we can provide some real analysis uh, to the business owner as to what those financial statements really mean. You know, what is a balance sheet? What is that? What's that really telling me? You know, what, what's a P&L? What's that telling me? What's what's my statement of cash flows? And so, and we can help the business owner identify key business metrics, whether it's financial metrics or operation me operational metrics. Uh, we can help them monitor that. What does it mean? We can help benchmark their financial data against the competition or against the industry standards. Uh, we can do some trend and variance analysis. And then, as that company continues to grow, we can continue to look at you know process improvements, whether it's on the on the financial accounting side, the operation side. And then we can also get into, you know, management team leadership, board of director communications, you know, bank relationships, negotiations, investor relationships, risk management. So we can provide really kind of a wealth of, you know, services, really depending on what that business owner needs. Um, you know, typically what we see is when we, you know, work with startups is that they really, they really kind of struggle with accounting concepts. You know, what does that mean? Typically they, they'll look at, you know, their financial statements more more you know cash basis. In other words, they're you know they they don't expense you know nothing hits hits an, an expense until it's get, it gets paid, and nothing is counted as revenue until that money is collected. And that's really cash basis financial statements, and so we really try to get in there and help them understand. Well, you know you really need to you know look at look at your financial statements from from a gap perspective or an accrual perspective. You know when those when are those expenses incurred? When are those revenues earned? Because those financial statements become a, a much more meaningful uh, when you tr when you you know keep track of those financials in, in that manner versus the cash basis, and so it, and also too, it's it, what what we found is that again they they struggle with the accounting concepts. So what does it really mean? And 
And at the end of the day, I mean, we've all heard this before. I mean, you know, a lot of businesses, well, not a lot, maybe most businesses live by this. You know, cash is king. And that is really true. And it's really being able to help them forecast and project, you know, their cash needs, especially early on in that startup phase. They're, you know, you want to look at cash burn and, and you know, what's what does that mean to the company? What's, you know, what when do I really need to, you know, be on the lookout? Because, uh, you know, early on when you're starting up, that, that cash is so important because you want to grow and you, you want those investor dollars to help your help your company grow. And you want to have a, you know, a plan in place and to be able to show those investors say, you know, this is this is where I, this is where I plan to be. This is how I'm going to get there. And this is the funding I'm going, to, I'm going to need in order to get my business to where I need it to go. So it's really just, you know, focusing on, you know, kind of basic blocking and tackling. But again, from an accounting standpoint, a lot of what we're finding in the biz ops is the small business owners just don't understand it. And so it's just getting, you know, sitting down with those business owners and, and you know, really, you know, helping guide them through, you know, their financial statements, what they mean, you know, what is the balance sheet really telling them? Is it a healthy balance sheet? Is a balance sheet that's not real healthy? And if it's not, what can we do to help improve that? Uh, the health of that balance sheet to attract investors uh, as that company continues to grow. Just because a company's making money, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that they're generating operating cash. And if they're not generating operating cash, why not? You know, we're, you know, can we can we speed up collections from their customers? Can we maybe slow down our payments to vendors? If they've got inventory, do they have too much inventory? Inventory doesn't do any good when it's sitting on the shelf. So it's really just, you know, managing that work, working capital and really just there's there's a, a lot of different things that we see. And at the end of the day, we feel like we can really create opportunities for those business owners. And by that, I mean, they're really good at their business. They know they know how to operate their business. They know, they know how to grow their business. They may not know how to do accounting and they may not really care to. So let us take that burden off their shoulders and let them focus on what they're good at. And like I said, that's growing their company. And to us, that's, we feel like we're really creating opportunities for that business owner to really accelerate and elevate uh, to that next level. And then what's that experience like for the customer? And I'll, I'll, I'll make that maybe a little bit more concrete. Am I paying hourly? Is this a fixed fee? Do I get a dedicated team? Is this, I submit requests somewhere online and it goes into a group and any number of people could potentially be following up with me? Like what, what does it look like when I engage with your team? Yeah. What we do is we can do, we can do two different, two different things. I mean, typically what we'll do is we'll start out on an hourly engagement because a lot of times we don't really know from a CLA perspective, kind of what we're getting into. And, and really, you know, vice versa. I mean, the business owner doesn't really know what they're getting, you know, out of CLA initially, you know, after that, you know, when we had that first initial meeting. So we typically, you know, work on an hourly rate and we get in there and within a couple of months, we can, we can kind of figure out, okay, this is, this is where we think we need to, to, to focus. And we, we start to work on the scope with that business owner to, you know, determine, okay, this is at your current state, this is what we believe the scope should be. And this is how we think we can really add value to you. And so we, we can start out on an hourly rate and then we can work towards a fixed fee engagement. What's nice about a fixed fee engagement is that business owner, from a budgeting perspective, obviously, they know what that expense, that monthly expense is going to be. And so there's no surprises. And so we can always work toward that fixed fee engagement. And as far as the how is a business owner, when they engage with CLA, what does that look like? Well, there's a team of 12 of us here in Indianapolis. And like I said, we range from staff accounting levels all the way up to CFO. And so typically, you're going to have local resources here at your fingertips. Now, what we found is there, there are some companies that, that really want that local presence. And there are other ones that, you know, they may not need a local presence per se, you know, a phone call, uh, go to meetings, Zoom, uh, an email. It, is, it works just great for them. And so if we get to the point where in Indianapolis, you know, our, our staff is at capacity, um, let's just say we've got a shared service center up in Minneapolis that basically could handle all the transactional type work, accounts receivable, accounts payable, that type of thing that works seamlessly with all the local offices around the nation. That's an option too. But we really like to 
focus with our clients and, and really like to have a local team here. And typically what you'll have is you'll have a controller or CFO leading the engagement. And then behind the scenes, you know, you'll have a staff or a senior accountant uh, doing the transactional work if that uh, is part of the part of the engagement. And typically that's what it is. But you'll always have, you know, a controller CFO leading that engagement with that business owner. And then I want to rewind. That was great, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just okay. jumping right on to the next thing. <laughs> I want to pick at a couple of things that you said before when you were talking through services that sounded particularly interesting to me. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the key business metrics that you would track for a small business, maybe even particularly an early stage tech company. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously, one of the most important things is cash burn. You know, how many months on hand of cash do they have to, to you know, to really run their operations? So that's that's important. Also, too, um, if they're if it's a company that's, you know, they're selling on credit. DSO is a very important metric we look at. And what that is basically day, day sales outstanding. So how long on average does it take your customers to pay you? Obviously, the, the, the shorter time span, if you can shorten that, that time frame, the better off you're going to be. You're going you're gonna to turn that sale into cash much quicker. Uh, what happens sometimes is what we'll see with um, startup companies, or really, it doesn't have to be startups, but it, I mean, it can happen across all spans of businesses, whether it's startup or a uh, very mature business. Customers may get into a situation where they they try to stretch. They try to stretch their their uh, their vendor. So that's important that you really look at that and you say, well, I mean, it's again, cash is king, and a lot of businesses will 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 play this. And, and you know, they'll if they are a customer of a company, they'll try to you know take that that cash right to the the very end of that term. Say they've got net thirty terms, they may pay on on day thirty or thirty one, thirty two. So it's, you know, trying to collect that, the money from your customers as quickly as you can, you know, paying your bills at your, at, at your terms. If you had net 30 terms, pay them, pay them on day 30, 31, 32. So DSO is really important. And if you look at also too, part of the, another part of that working capital, especially with, with companies that have inventory, really watch that inventory because what you'll see a lot of times is, especially with new companies uh, that, that do deal with inventory. They may tend to they may tend to overbuy some inventory, and again, like I said, that inventory doesn't do much when it's sitting on the shelf. It's got to move. So the longer that inventory sits on your shelf, that's just cash that's tied up that you can't use. So it's basically cash that's trapped on your balance sheet. Um, now I know with tech companies, inventory doesn't really play, doesn't play a huge factor there, but um, nevertheless, for some startups that do, that do have inventory, that can be a factor. So really, it's the working capital, Mike. It, it's 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 monitoring your cash, your cash burn, your working capital components of accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventory if you have it. Those are really the key metrics there. And then also too, you know, other metrics you want to look at, you know, pricing. You know, are they priced right in the marketplace? Is there some room there for some price increases potentially? Let's play with that. How do you coach a entrepreneur through pricing? Because that, I mean, certainly for a SaaS product, I mean, that's always a, it's always an unknown or even even a services business, it's it's always you know it, it's hard to know what the real economic rent available in the market is. So, what does that process look like when you go in and start working with an entrepreneur around that? Yeah, I think I think that the really the, the main focus there, Mike, is I think what happens a lot of times is are you leaving some chips on the table from the standpoint of really think of think of it from a, from a value perspective. I mean, what true value are you bringing to those customers? And I think if you can really articulate that with your customer base and really, you know, provide to them, look, I mean, if, if you're using our product, this is the real value you're, you're going to realize, you know, and, and maybe that maybe that value is wrapped up into to one or two or three or four different kind of components of that product. But I think if you really focus on that value and you can really communicate that with your customers, then I think that's where you that's where you start really you know, seeing some opportunity to really price that appropriately. I mean, pricing is a tough game. I mean, pricing is hard, like you said, Mike, whether it's, you know, with startups or mature companies, new products coming out on the market, you know, how do you really price that? You know, what will the market bear? And it's really difficult. And I think, I think a lot of times what companies will do is they will, they will kind of, maybe they'll undersell it a bit. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll think, well, you know, I think it's, 
maybe I, I don't want to price myself too high because I, I, I don't want to price myself out of the market immediately. And so they may tend to, to go a little bit lower. Whereas I think, you know, really trying to decipher and, and determine what that true value is to that customer base. And the more value you can bring, obviously, you know, to your customers, that's real opportunity. I, I feel like for the, for the entrepreneurs, for the, for the business owners out there that, that have been doing it for a while, it really gives them some opportunity to, to really look at that and say, you know what, I think I can get into the market here at a little higher, higher price because of the true value I, I you know, I'm bringing, you know, to those customers. So again, at the end of the day, Mike, it's, it's, it, I wish we had a magic pill and we had a crystal ball that we could say, you know what, you need to price your, <laughs> price your product at this price point. But again, I think it's all about value and what, and, and I know from CLA's perspective, when we help our clients and we work with our clients, that's, that's just at the forefront of our mind. We really want to bring value to those clients and really provide them the experience that we have and the, and the knowledge we can bring to the table. And we really feel like that that's, you know, delivering value to the, to the clients. And, and, and when we do that, a client's not going to, they're, they're going to be more than willing to, to, to pay whatever that price point may be. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. And before you had also mentioned helping with communications to the board of directors and or investor relationships, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the things that you guys might do there? Yeah, absolutely. Especially from a financial perspective, I mean, again, re- helping read financial statements. What does it mean? You know, when you're at a board meeting and and maybe the 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 board is asking questions about, you know, what's your cash cycle look like? What what what's your cash cycle look like? Excuse me, or what's your cash burn? You know, helping with those communications and and, and you know, helping the business owner understand why is the board asking me these questions, or you know, what what is what's the rationale? You know, and you know, if we look at what we can do on that too, is we can do a lot of modeling for the for the for the clients as well too. And by modeling, I mean you know typically we'll do you know three statement models. So we can model out your balance sheet, your P and L. We can model out your cash flow statement, and we can look at different you know what levers do we need to pull in order to you know if we want to see twenty percent growth next year at, at the company, then what levers are we going to have to pull that you know that that impact both. All three statements, basically, you know, the balance sheet, the PL, the cash flow statement. What kind of funding are we going to need to have? What does it look like? Are we have to go? Are we, are we going to have to do? Uh, are we have to do a, um, a capital raise? Uh, can we do traditional bank financing? Do we need to bring along some sub debt? Whatever it might be, based on whatever they want to do. So, what we can help with from a board standpoint is we can help interpret those models and help the business owner communicate to the board. You know, this is. This is where we think we're going to be in, in, in the next three years. Here's the staff we're going to have to hire. Here's the investment in infrastructure we're, we're going to need, you know, above and beyond the staff, let's say. Investment in equipment, you know, cap, capital expenditures, that type of thing. What does that cash flow look like? What do the lending sources look like? Are we going to have to do a capital raise? If so, when? What's that look like? Are there going to be, you know, equity components along with that as well, too? So those types of things really kind of, really kind of built around the finances, Mike, you know, and what, what are those numbers really telling you and telling the board and helping communicate, helping those business owners communicate those, that type of information to the board of directors. And, and same thing with investors as well. I mean, if investors are looking at the financial statements and they're diving in and, set, and, they, and they start asking, you know, hey, in three years, you know, you want to grow, you know, you want to double your business in three years or, or triple your business in three years. How are you going to do that? And what what is your what is your cash? What are your cash needs look like? You know, your sources and uses of cash. You know, what is all that? What does all that look like? And how's it all tied together? What's your balance sheet going to look like? We can help the business owner communicate that clearly to those investors, to the board of directors. And so there's, you know, it gives some more clarity around what that what the big picture really looks like. 
Perfect. Thanks. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You bet. So you are uh, in the process of announcing a new emerging business package. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what that looks like and um, kind of what some of the goals are there? Yeah, it's a it's a package that we're rolling out, and we're you know really focused on on, on startups uh, and companies really you know under twenty employees. But it's really an opportunity you know to go to these business owners and say, look kind of like what I touched on earlier, you know, we'd like to really help you create opportunities. And by that, I mean, let us take care of the accounting work for you so you can really focus on growing your business. And so we're, we're interested or we're excited about coming to market with a package that for essentially $850 a month, business owners can, you know, have some, get their bookkeeping done. We can help them, you know, get their financial statements ready on a monthly basis, help them with clothes. Uh, we can help them do their taxes. And we can also, too, consult with them and, and provide some advisory uh, experience to those clients on a monthly basis uh, for that one flat fee. And, and like I said, mentioned earlier, the flat fee uh, is nice for business owners because it gives them peace of mind every month. They know what that fee is going to be. There are no surprises from an hourly engagement. So it's, it's very simple, very straightforward. So, yeah, we're excited about you know rolling this out. We really feel like that, 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 you know, getting back to pricing, we feel like it's really priced appropriately uh, for those startups. We know, again, startups are, you know, cash is king, and they're really watching their expenses during this phase of their business growth. And so we really think it's, it's an opportunity for us to help those clients uh, really get to the next level and help them, help them scale up, and, and we'll be right there alongside them helping them do that. When you think of kind of a, a target customer for this in terms of could be size type of business, uh, stage of the company, or like uh, just getting formed right now or already in operations. Paint for me a picture of who would be the, the target customer for this. Yeah, I think really it's it, it's somebody that's that's really getting in that startup phase, Mike, and, and really startup and, and, and really going through that probably the first phase of growth. Because like I said, it's, you know, uh, Companies maybe up to twenty, you know, twenty employees, you know, a couple million dollars in revenue, uh, you know, potentially. Just really, again, somebody that, that that really has to a business owner that really needs to be focused on what they're good at and grow, and that's growing their business. And, and they really don't have time to to do the the accounting work that's necessary uh, to help them or to provide them with meaningful meaningful financial statements, so they can go to investors and, and ask for that next round of financing or whatever be so it's it's um really those types of companies is what we're really looking at right now and then as, a, as those companies really start to scale up and and really start to see explosive growth then we can talk about some other services that we can incorporate and maybe we would go to a, a little bit different pricing model at that time but right now that's really it's a startup uh really early stage growth uh companies that we're looking at perfect all right, let's hit some of the fun stuff. What are some of the most common mistakes you see in early stage companies when you and your team start to engage? And you you don't have to name companies here. You can protect the uh, protect the guilty. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, one thing that we see a lot of times is the chart of accounts. You know, they may have, they're you know a lot of times a lot of the companies that we work with, and really it's a platform that we that we promote at, at CLA is QuickBooks. You know, everybody know you know a lot of people have heard of QuickBooks, QuickBooks Online. We'll see, you know, chart of accounts that that probably aren't set up uh, the way they should be. We see transactions that are recorded incorrectly. I mean, I think that's probably a lot of it. Mike is just they just don't. A lot of times, like I said, the business owners may have just enough accounting experience that that they know just really. Uh, I don't even want to say the basics. I mean, it, they just they. I think they think they know more than they really do. And that, and by no means, I, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I'm just saying it's they think they're doing the right thing. And so a lot of times we'll go in. It, it, a lot of times when we start initially with a client, is it's just a, a lot of cleanup work. You know, things are posted incorrectly. Chart of accounts aren't set up appropriately. And a lot of times they're just they're just, you know, looking at their checkbook. How much cash do I have? You know, that's 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 what I'm you know, that's that's what I'm worried about. And, and that's what they should be worried about. But I would say it's just a lot of. Transactions that, are, that aren't posted correctly, chart of accounts isn't set up appropriately. Uh, it's not meaningful. 
yeah, I think that's those really are, are probably the top items or things that are things just aren't recorded at all. We'll, you know, we'll start getting into a company's financial statements and start asking about, you know, question or start asking questions. We'll see bank statements that have transactions on them that are nowhere to be found in QuickBooks. So a lot of, you know, asking, you know, the business owner, a lot of questions, well, what's this for? And, and, you know, what was this all about? So uh, again, they're so, they're, they're so busy, you know, running their business. A lot of times they'll, they'll just forget about, you know, recording transactions altogether. And so I'd say, I'd say that's another big one that we see is it just missing transactions. How often, how, it's one of the things that we're experiencing in one of our companies, we have to do an annual audit, uh, which is kind of a, in, in our world, kind of an, an outlier. Most of our companies don't have to do audits. How, how talk a little bit about, about that. How often do you see a need for an audit for an early stage company? And then when you do see that, what do you do to help the entrepreneur prep for that? Yeah, a lot of times we, we, we've had some clients come in that, that have needed some SOC 2 audits. And typically what we'll do is we'll refer those over to our tax and insurance group. SOC 2 is, is some of the, if, if they're selling into some spaces that where their customers, their customer base is, is requiring their clients to, to have a SOC 2 audit, that is, you know, something we've seen early on. Real, real quick, if somebody's not familiar with SOC 2, can you describe that real quick, what that is? Yeah, you know, Michael, I'll have to get some more. <laughs> can, I, can I come back to that question? <laughs> you can. I, I okay. can't remember what it means, but it, it's basically uh, or like what it stands for. I don't I don't know what SOC 2 stands for, but my understanding is it's basically uh, kind of a an assurance that this business will uh, has its operations in order. Correct. That's correct. Yes. It, yes. In a very general sense, Mike, you're absolutely right. That's what it is. That's what it is. All right. Sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Uh, oh, it's, that's okay. It's, that's okay. Well, I I opened the door when I said sock two, and as soon as I said that, I thought, oh, I hope Mike doesn't come back and ask me <laughs> a lot of details about sock two. It's all good. Sorry, keep okay. going. Okay, but other than other than that, that's really really that's about the only type of audit request we've seen uh, from a startup. Yeah, got it. Perfect. Other kind of common mistakes on like, uh, you know, one of the things that would be interesting maybe to get a comment on, and maybe this isn't a common mistake, or maybe you've seen other patterns here, but I know like with COVID and PPP loans in particular, I'm in a, a couple of CEO groups and in, in all of those pretty across the board and, and, you know, for, for at least one of them, it's a, it's a nationwide group. We've got companies represented from all over the United States we've pretty much seen small banks win when it comes to PPP loans. I know we were able to get ours successfully with a small bank and, you know, most of the companies that we saw that got through the first round, in fact, from memory, I think all of them that we saw that got through the first round were all working with small banks. Anybody working with a large bank didn't, didn't get anything until round two. Is that congruent with your experience? And outside of, you know, global pandemics, what what would be your advice uh, for a small company working with a small bank versus a, you know, a large national bank? Yeah, I think that's, that, that's a great that's a great question, Mike. And, and yes, you know, to your first question, we, we, we saw the same thing with uh, with our clients. You know, if they were dealing with with larger banks uh, or large banks, they were they that first round, they, they, they pretty much got passed up and they, they may have got some funding in round two. I even had a client you know, apply at their, at their big, at their large bank who they normally bank with. And they were, they just grew a little impatient and they applied to a smaller bank and they actually got a response back from the smaller bank. The big bank then got back to them a couple of days later and said, Hey, I see that you've already applied for this. And they're like, yeah, we have, we got the funding. You know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it, it's a lot of times what you'll see is with the big banks, they can offer a lot, but what you'll find is that there's it can take a lot of time sometimes to 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 get some answers to to really get what those small business owners are looking for. If those small business owners you know are looking to work with a smaller bank, whether it's a local or a regional, a lot of times they'll they'll get a lot more attention. They're very attentive. They they step right up to the plate for their customers, and they will do everything they can to really help those customers succeed. Sometimes just working with a local bank or a small regional bank, 
can really bring a lot of benefits to those small business owners versus working with a larger bank uh, that has a lot of assets under their under their purview. And sometimes, you know, small business owners might not, not that they're forgotten, but they may be better off going with a smaller local, like I said, or a smaller regional to really get that hands-on feel, you know, the hands-on approach uh, and to really feel like that they're taken care of and that they're, that the bank really has their best interest at heart. Talk about any other possible relationships and banking was was one that came to mind just because of uh, the obvious tie to finance. Talk about some of the other relationships that that you might be bringing to the table in terms of introductions or partnering to help one of your clients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's part of, again, that's part of what CLA likes to do, create opportunities for our clients. So, you know, we've got, uh, we know, you know, quite a few of the law firms around town. We, you know, we belong to some networking groups uh, around town. And, and what we really like to say at CLA is that, you know, if we, if we're engaging a prospect and for some reason, you know, the prospect, you know, we don't, we don't, so, something happens and, and the prospect doesn't become a client. Um, sometimes that happens. Um, you know, we, we don't like it when it happens, but sometimes it will happen. We are still more than happy. You know, we will reach out to those those prospects and say, look, you know, this may not have worked out, but, you know, CLA is still all about creating opportunities. And if there's anything we can do for that prospect, you know, whether it's, you know, connecting them to, you know, a law firm, a bank, whatever it might be, uh, any type of connection they want to, you know, they if they're trying to pick up a new customer and, and CLA has a has some sort of relationship with that customer, We'd be, we'll be more than happy to provide introductions. We just really want to be seamless. And, and really, I think that, that goes a long way from the standpoint of you know, that prospect may not have become a client that day. But I think that, you know, fully believe that the more that we help them and, and to show that, you know, we're, we're, we're there for them, they will, be, they will become a client. And so it's really important to us. And, and Randy Dial, you know Randy well, Mike. I mean, he's... He's our local MPO and Randy is so, so well connected. And that's really one of the things that Randy is so great at. Uh, it's really helping people, helping companies and, and people and helping the community and, and really making good connections. And so it's, again, I think that's one thing that, that really helps set CLA apart from, from uh, uh, the other firms out there that people may talk to. And it's all, like I said, it's all about creating opportunities. I think that seems like a good place to wrap. If folks would like to get in touch with you or learn more about CLA, what's the best way for them to do that? Absolutely. Uh, they can reach out to me. My my email address is chris.wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, at claconnect.com. That's all one word, claconnect.com. So it's chris.wright at claconnect.com. My, you can call me at 317-569-6159. Brave I, man. <laughs> obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. So, yeah, you can, you know, reach out. Uh, be glad to talk to you. But, you know, be glad to talk to you and, and see what kind of opportunities we can create together. Awesome. Chris, thanks so much, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.